afternoon and welcome to Capital Account. I'm Lauren Lister here in Washington, D.C. These are your headlines for Monday, July 30th, 2012. The CEO of RBS is warning in a Guardian interview about a huge fine facing the bank due to the LIBOR scandal, while HSBC set aside two billion bucks to cover regulatory problems, things like LIBOR rigging and money laundering. Now, we spend a lot of time covering regulation violations by the big banks. Let's flip that around today. We'll talk about a litany of absurd small business regulations that could be crushing entrepreneurs. Meanwhile, Mitt Romney was in Poland after making headline for his trip to Israel and tough Iran talk after the UK blunders, of course. This is all while on his foreign jet setting, the latest in election 2012. But if this is campaigning noise to you and you're looking beyond the constructs of the modern U.S. democratic system for alternative ideas, Maybe you're disillusioned with what capitalism has become. Well, you're in luck, because we'll hear from author Jeffrey Tucker about anarchy and the role it can play in building a new civilization in the digital age. Plus, Sarbanes-Oxley turns 10 today. Happy birthday. But the threat of jail time for executives knowingly signing off on inaccurate financial reports hasn't been used to go after financial crisis-related incidents. So what gives? And what's the lesson? We'll talk about it. Let's get to today's capital account. Now, as you probably know, as we have a dedicated, loyal audience, we spend a lot of time, a great deal of time, rather, on this show talking about the big picture of the financial system and financial regulation, the need for it, the lack of enforcement in many cases, the burden of compliance costs for small firms versus the large, too big to fail firms that can not only shoulder the cost of violating these regulations, but can also spend such a large amount of money lobbying to influence them. Today, just to give you an example, we see headlines from RBS over a LIBOR settlement, from HSBC putting aside $2 billion in the face of regulatory scrutiny over a bunch of stuff, money laundering, other alleged indiscretions. But what about the overabundance of little regulations, smaller regulations that could be crippling or burdening small business owners and entrepreneurs trying to make it during a difficult time, no less. A small business, just for everybody that wants to know what we're talking, is defined as having fewer than 500 employees. And according to the U.S. Small Business Administration, they represent 99.7% of all employer firms, employing half of private sector employees and generating 65% of net new jobs over the past 17 years. Now, are there mixed reviews as to whether they truly are the economic engine of growth for the economy? To use an incredibly hackneyed phrase, sure, there are. But do these small government regulations matter? You bet. Just ask our guest, Jeffrey Tucker. He's executive editor of Laissez Faire Books and author of A Beautiful Anarchy How to Create Your Own Civilization in the Digital Age, which is coming out pretty soon. And we're so happy that he is on the show making his stop in D.C. to be on Capital Account with us. Thanks, Jeffrey. Thank you, Lauren. It's really great to be here. It's amazing to have you here, fresh from the Agora Financial That's right. Symposium, That's I right. know. That's right. Right. Now, right. before we get to your book, which I can't wait to talk to you about, no. I do want to touch on this issue of these smaller government regulations that are a real burden to small businesses, to entrepreneurs, and one that you've recently been writing about has to do with the large soda ban that Bloomberg has proposed in New York. Yeah. And you bring up the example of Honest Tea, which is a tea company. Yeah. They, they're trying to make less sugary, more healthy drinks for folks. Uh, however, they're complaining about this soda ban, and that struck a chord with you, well, so I want to elaborate on why. That's right. I mean, they got snagged in the, in the soda, soda ban, um, and like many entrepreneurs who are, they weren't specifically targeted, but they got uh, snagged because their, their uh, container was a little bit over what the, what the uh, regulation allowed. And, you know, this is just one example. We only know about it because the CEO of the company happened to write an article about it. You know, it's so pathetic. The business pages these days are filling up with pleas from businessmen, just let me sell my products to consumers. Can I, can I please create jobs? Is it okay if I bring consumers stuff that they, they want? I mean, what have happened to the whole land of the free? 
idea. And they're, they're reduced to, have to having to go to the op-ed pages, pages and begging for the right to do business. And we only know about a fraction of them. Most of them, of course, don't have access to the op-ed pages. They just suffer in silence. And so many more would-be entrepreneurs never be able to create businesses at all because of the gigantic number of regulations, which are expanding even in the middle of this terrible, you know, sort of stagnation mm -hmm. uh, style economy. And I would suggest that major reason for the stagnation is precisely the regulatory state, which is just gargantuan. I, I want to talk about a few of the things that you just got into. Yeah. So one is this idea that uh, small business owners now have to go to the pages of the Wall Street Journal to write an op-ed. Yeah. Do you think it's it marks pathetic. a change? Is that well, a change? Well, I think, think it is a change. It is a change. You know, um, because they don't really want to do this. But for one thing, it's very risky to go public and say, look, the feds are going after me. You know, they broke down my, the door of my factory and confiscated all my stuff. Uh, they shouldn't be doing this. I mean, you, you, you risk making yourself more of a target, more of the vengeance of the bureaucratic class. So, you, <laughs> right? So you would far rather just be silent about it and resolve it through some sort of litigation or something like that. But when they're desperate, that's when they go, they pu go public and okay. make these kind of pleas. And so, yeah, we only know a fraction of them because there aren't too many people who have access to the pages of the Wall Street, Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have blogs and things, but, you know, mostly business suffers in silence. I mean, it's, it's very tragic what we're seeing in this, in this country. I mean, practically every good and service in this physical world is heavily regulated with a kind of central plan that's the accumulated cruft really of decades and decades of legislatures and regulators passing regulations, all of which are applicable at any one moment in time. And the only people who really care are the people who are really profoundly affected by them. I mean, there's a lot of suffering going on right now. And of all times to do this, of all, this is the time when we ought to be radically deregulating. As you say, finance is a different matter, but- Yeah, which is the, something the that you, a free market world. guy, yeah. has agreed upon before, yeah, that that's yeah. kind of a different thing. But we're talking about just barriers to entry for, oh. for small businesses, for entrepreneurs that want want to get into the game, Well, that's right? right. And Lauren, it really touches on a theme that I've really been emphasizing. I think what we've seen is a dramatic change in the ethos of government. In the old days, I'm talking like a century ago, the idea of government was that we were going to bring human progress, human flourishing, uh, inspire more creation of material wealth, so we're going to electrify your rural community and give you all kinds. That's like what the New Deal was all about, right? Mm -hmm. Well, everything has changed. Now it's like bureaucrats don't have anything to do except reverse progress, make you more miserable, take things away from you, deny you services, deny you goods, and just it's just a big don't do this, don't do this kind of state. It's we come to the point where if something's not mandatory, it's forbidden. I mean, in the United States, mm -hmm. this is really true. It's not an exaggeration. Well, to, to, to keep on your point, you talked about not just the uh, new arbitrary creation of, of new laws that businesses have to keep up with to make sure they're not violating, yeah. but also the arbitrary way that they're carried out and enforced. That's right. And you brought up the example of the Gibson guitar yeah. raids. Now, that happened a while back. Gibson right. was raided because of the wood they were using. Their guitars yeah. were confiscated. Millions of dollars were lost. And part of that issue had to do with regulatory bodies disagreeing yes, that's on right. even the way that's right. that you the can. regulation should be right. enforced. So how do you even how do you even no. counter it's an how do you even it's, factor right. that into your it's business It's an irrational plan? system because really we, we see on any given day the accumulation enforcement of like 100 years of regulations. All all of which are applicable today and they're all contradictory and they're all spread across many many different agencies and so you have to you know have huge teams of lawyers just to be able to make a, a guitar I mean it's it's crazy in that case is particularly strange because it, it wasn't really about the wood they were using it was about where the wood was uh, in final production you know was it here or was it in a foreign country mm -hmm. I mean totally arbitrary stuff mm -hmm. uh, and that's just one tiny sliver of the kind of problems we're dealing with which are gigantic what do you think is the solution to this because we're we're talking about a regulatory system that has become just so yeah. complex yeah. and so laden with problems. So yeah. this is kind of regulation gone awry. So, so what is the solution well, to Well, I think you know what, what these regulations do is that they put a ban on creativity. I mean, this is the sad thing. These regulations are strange. They presume there's no future, that mm -hmm. there won't be progress, that there won't be improvement. So they lock everything in place. You know, like I say, everything's got a central plan. I mean, I went online one time, pulled up a PDF, which has the government's model and ideal for the push lawnmower. Mm -hmm. It must be made this way, it must be made this way. And it's true for everything, from, from toilets to faucets to, I mean, to light bulbs. I mean, and we're seeing a light bulb ban coming. I mean, it's getting grim. I think we need a wholesale uprooting of the entire regulatory state. What accomplishes that? 
I don't know. I don't believe that a single president could do it or a single legislature could do it. I mean, we just need a dramatic transformation. We Does need that to mean an overhaul of the system no, or I think, the way I they're done? No, I think we need to uproot, mean... uproot everything and, and, and get of, rid of the entire regulatory structure. I'd like to see the Federal Register thrown into a gigantic pile in the middle of the street and burned, you know, like, like, uh, like in, in Middle Ages or something. Else. I mean, that would be a good kind of book burning, actually. <laughs> what keeps, though, you know, people from being poisoned from eating bad food? I mean, during the days where there were no regulations, people were getting locked in factories and burned to deaths because their employers could lock them in, or dying from meat because the meat factories were right. disgusting. Well, I think what, what, what you discover in the, in the private sector is it turns out people who make food don't want to poison people. Yeah, but sometimes they do because that happens. <laughs> well, it does happen despite the regulatory state, right? I mean, I mean, it's happening now. I mean, the. I hear this all the time. People bring up the nightmare scenarios if we have freedom. Oh, this would be terrible. But every time they present a nightmare scenario to me, it sounds like it's going on right now, despite the biggest, most intrusive, most well-funded Leviathan in the history of the world right here on this country. Oh, what is that? The United States government. <laughs> There's never been a bigger government in, the, in, in all of human history. Think about it. Okay, well. And it is growing, not shrinking, contrary to what the New York Times was claiming yesterday. Oh, my God. Okay, well, <laughs> Jeffrey, let's talk about a radically different approach to that issue, which is something that you write about. Right. Your book is focused on it, which is anarchy. Right. So let's all open our minds, and why don't you tell yeah. us in one minute before we go to break real quickly why anarchy the one is. minute case case for anarchy yeah, we'll right. get back to it right. after the break so but the, just the goal you know, of the of, give of, us a of the, yeah the goal of the book is to make anarchy not scary it's called a beautiful anarchy which it is beautiful and then the analogy i'm using here is about communication and we live in an age of astonishing global communication unlike we've ever anything we've ever seen before instantaneous networks anybody in the world can talk to anybody else and what are they trading? They're tra trading the most valuable commodity in the world, which is knowledge. And it's a beautiful thing. It's uncontrolled. It's uncensored. Uh, every conversation takes place with a matter of mutual learning and mutual benefit. And I'm suggesting in the book that this model of conversation that's now global and instantaneous and not in geographically non-contiguous in the most beautiful way can be a metaphor for the reconstruction of the whole world as a voluntary order. That's the thesis of the book. All right, yeah. okay, so hey, we'll talk about more about that beautiful anarchy in just a couple <laughs> minutes on the other side of a break when we'll have more with Jeffrey Tucker, author and executive editor of Laissez Faire Books. And still ahead, with the volatility in stocks and bonds, investors are looking into alternative investment trends. Some include boozing. We'll tell you what they are in a special segment of Loose Change where Jeffrey Tucker will join us. But first, your closing market numbers. drives the world. The fear-mongering used by politicians. Who makes decisions? Considerable breakthrough has already been made. Who can you trust? No one who is imbued with a global missionary zeal. Where are we heading? State-controlled capitalism is called fascism. When nobody dares to ask, we do. RT question more. You know how sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know? I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. We'll get to real headlines with none of the mercy. The problem with the mainstream media today is that they're completely disconnected from the viewers and from what actually matters to those viewers. And so that's why young people just don't watch TV anymore. If they want news, they go online and read it. But we're trying to take those stories that people actually care about and transfer them back to TV. Welcome back. Ten years ago, July 30th, 2012, 
President George W. Bush signed into law the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. The new regulations were passed to try to tighten up corporate governance, enhance financial disclosure, and combat corporate and accounting fraud. That was one of the big deals, the threat of jail time for corporate executives who knowingly certified inaccurate financial reports. In fact, when Bush signed the law, he reportedly made this threat. No more easy money for corporate criminals, just hard time. And he called the legislation the most far-reaching reforms of American business practices since the time of FDR. Well, after the financial crisis, where is the hard time for Sarbanes-Oxley violators related to it? It's something we've talked about with a number of guests who've laid out concrete evidence they believe of violations that have gone unpunished leading up to the financial crisis. Here are a few examples. We know that there is very, very clear evidence that there were false certifications by the senior management of Citigroup and senior management of Lehman Brothers, among others. It seems like with this example you gave of Sarbanes-Oxley, it seems like you have a disaster like Enron, right. and then you have an effort to regulate so that it doesn't happen again, like with Sarbanes-Oxley. And then you have the same practices that continue and post Enron go unpunished. So my question for you, what is the point of regulation if they're not enforced? Is it just for show? Yes, it is for show. It looks as if the regulators are there to protect the bad guys. We didn't hold CEOs of our major banks accountable for accounting statements that they signed off on in 2007 that were false. So happy 10th birthday, Sarbanes-Oxley. Is there some bigger lesson here, given that your birthday is such kind of a non-event because you aren't really a big deal anymore, seemingly? Is there a bigger lesson about regulation? I want to bring back Jeffrey Tucker, executive editor of Laissez-Faire Books and author of the upcoming A Beautiful Anarchy, How to Create Our Own Civilization in the Digital Age, because I want to ask Jeffrey what he thinks kind of the bigger picture les lesson is here, because here's this massive regulation that's supposed to give us a big bazooka to combat fraud and it's just sitting there unused despite well, the financial crisis. it's not quite crisis. unused. That's the thing. It's being used against Americans. I mean, regular people are actually suffering from this. Did you know that American, many American entrepreneurs are establishing banks internationally and they cannot accept wonderful banks that are providing good services. They cannot accept Americans as part of their, their depositors because that opens up a tremendous legal, legal liability to the bank it, itself. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of financial iron curtain being drawn up around this country and American citizens uh, so that our rights are being limited to to shop internationally for finance. I mean, nobody wants to have anything to do with this. Yeah, I mean, it's like the American passport is Americans, like... Americans, they, they won't no. let Americans open I mean, accounts even if you right. live there. Even yeah. if you're, you know, it's very difficult because of like the foreign account yeah. uh, compliance regulations that have come down Yeah, from that's right. The IRS. Yeah, so you've got all these regulations that have really, and they've combined at a time when the Federal Reserve has absolutely demolished and broken the banking system with this stupid zero interest rate mm -hmm. policy which just violates all kinds of, you know, normalcy of the natural free market. Laws. Yeah, natural law is insane. <laughs> so you, and so you've got, you know, a desperate scramble to try to somehow make money with, with, your, with your savings and our, our options for American citizens are getting increasingly limited and we're being sort of walled in mm -hmm. into um, this, this country and its broken system. Mm -hmm. It's really very tragic and it, it has a profound effect on, on economic growth. Too. So you think it's the unintended consequences of these I regulations don't if it's that don't unintended. do exactly like what they I, could do? You know, in after a while, you watch these regulations. How can it really be unintended? I mean, are these people really stupid, or are they partly evil? I mean, maybe it's well, a combination. You know, I don't know. Of That's a great question. I wish we did know the answer to that. Yeah. But I do want to keep going on this anarchy thing. So yeah. before the break, you laid out what your book is. Now, anarchy for some people may have a negative connotation. They may think of yeah. black block protesters bashing in windows, uh, lighting silly. cars on fire, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. You know, what is your view? or vision for anarchy. Well, so it seems to me your vision of people, you know, bashing in cars and destroying things, that to me is the government bureaucrat. I mean, that's a perfect example of what they do. They do it with, in suits and they do it quietly, but they're practically destroying the physical world. The beautiful thing is that in 1995 emerged this, this beautiful thing. The, the internet was privatized and we've seen the creation of a beautiful and orderly and productive and prosperous and progressing um, international network of communication and the app economy is one example. Nobody regulates that. Mm -hmm. And yet it exists. I and mean, every day we wake up and there's progress. Mm -hmm. There's 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. There's new apps, new opportunities, new beautiful things happening. When I first got in the editorial business, it was like truly 
The pre-internet days was like the dark ages. You didn't know who was writing, who could do anything, everything, all correspondence was through mail. Nowadays, we can contact anybody in real time with wireless devices and talk to them face to face. It's a beautiful thing. In other words, this is an order created through the private sector and through the free market. But then how do you apply that to government? Because you can't really get into a war that destroys civilization mm. via an app. I mean, maybe you could, but I haven't heard of it yet. So one of the arguments against something like anarchy is what happens in this situation of war, combat, people are always going to try and take others territory so I mean don't you need some kind of well what happens I think in the case of, of wars that you know two two big governments battling it out with each other and I would like to see um, the US engaged in a kind of US, uh, unilateral disarmament <laughs> I mean you know Canada doesn't have a, a gigantic um, national defense and nobody's bugging them I always think of Costa Rica so yeah I think we could see some dramatic uh, d uh, cuts and, and defense and make the world a more peaceful place I think governments tend to be warlike mm -hmm. you know and, and and not preventing war, but starting wars. I mean, certainly American history shows that. So the beautiful thing I think we learn from looking at the digital world is how productive and orderly and creative private individuals cooperating with each other, all countries, all languages. We can do wonderful things together. And to me, this is this is the future. We, we can rise up against contraband. That's I right. Oh, this you, is I want to give you some tea. contraband. So this is the 16.9 <laughs> ounce tea that we were talking about that the CEO wrote, wrote an op-ed about because his bottles that he invested this? it are okay. 0.9 ounces too big for what would be allowed mm. under the soda ban. So cheers mm. to small businesses, I cheers. guess. Cheers to <laughs> private sector. Ah, uh, yeah, the forbidden fruit. Pretty good. Doesn't, yeah, doesn't, no, it's very good. That sweet. <laughs> so the forbidden fruit, we've tasted it, and we are going to wrap up with Jeffrey Tucker, author of Laissez Faire Books. But don't worry, because we're setting up behind us for loose change, and he is going to stick around for that. So yes. Jeffrey Tucker, we'll have more in a second. Very good. All right, let's wrap up with loose change. And as promised, we have Dimitri and Jeffrey here Jeffrey, and Shannon nice in the control room. So we've got a, a whole crew here to talk about some fun stories. Because with the volatility <laughs> in stocks and bonds, investors are looking into alternative investment trends to hedge. Here's one option. The concept of investing in wine isn't really new. People have been doing it privately for years in their own cellars. And in fact, there are a handful of funds in the UK delivering relatively consistent and handsome returns. But it's new in the US. So there's wine. And according to the New York Post, art, wine, musical instruments, even classic cars are other niche funds promising high returns from 15% for cars to 30% for wines. That wine, rather, that investors are increasingly turning into. So this is an investment that not only can you buy, but you can drink it if things really go wrong and if your investment, you know, plummets. Hey, at least you got the booze, right? It's, it's all part <laughs> of, the, of this of the scramble for return. I mean, you've got a world where the Federal Reserve has has destroyed the ability to make money by saving money. So of course, people are turning to crazy things, and this is really what's behind the LIBOR scandal, for example. I mean, it's it's an, a desperate seeking out of return in a world of zero zero interest rate. So yeah, it's going to be wild. It's going to be, I think a lot of people are, are actually scrambling for internet stocks and we're starting to see some south would turn there. A bubble and it may turn to bust uh, yeah. before long. It's a kind of distortion that comes about when Federal Reserve manipulates the credit markets. Yeah, you have to look for things outside of the financial yeah. system in order to invest in, whether it's farmland, That's gold, right. classic cars, wine, art, alternative yeah, things, black thing walnut wine, trees. The good thing with wine is that you're inherently, you're inherently hedged because if things get really bad, you get wasted. And, and then you, you, know can, I mean? you can put yourself out of your misery. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, worst case scenario, if, 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 you know, if it's not a good investment, just drink it, get wasted. Uh, but, you know, there's something to that. You know it's, yeah. so, it's really tragic, though. It's a real estate in your 1929 car. But you have to be some, like, some sort of amazing expert. Like me, I buy my wines based entirely on the, the name and the, whether the label is cool or not. I mean, that's, that's my basis. For, and I don't think that's a good basis for investing in wine, probably. So, anyway. Is bourbon a good investment? Well, probably. I know it's it good is for probably, breakfast. Yeah, yeah. 
that's right. That's right. That's right. Well, what was that thing that we had? We had me and you. I was in Vancouver when we were together. Oh, and we had a drink. Thing. Tell oh, our audience about. I tell our audience about this drink. No, I think this is the drink of 2012. It's called the Negroni, and it's a 19th century drink. And it's Campari. It's sweet vermouth. It's gin. I mean, and I'm told too that it will give you a long life. Oh, so there's a there's a different there's kind of <laughs> value in an investment, something that'll give you a long life. Yeah. Let's to enjoy uh, it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Every which way. Let's move yeah. on. Let's enjoy one more story. Let's try uh, because we've talked a lot about the lack of jail time for bankers and execs who committed crimes leading to the financial crisis in 2008. How is this for a change of pace? According to Al Jazeera, death terms in Iran bank scandal. This story out of the 39 people tried for fraud in, in relation to this banking scandal, the biggest in the country's history, court orders death for four of those convicted. Is this more of the direction that maybe would be helpful in combating <laughs> financial crimes, dare I say? Well, it does seem to be a little bit of a turnabout, doesn't it? We it can't imagine anything remotely like that contrast. in this country. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. Well, I mean, imagine if John Corzine had to, you know, face uh, sticking his head through a noose. Yeah. Before, uh, but he's just walking around drinking frappuccinos, cappuccinos in, in the Hamptons, enjoying himself. Yeah, they you know change I mean? everything. So, yeah, and they used to, they it used to be a, a capital, uh, they used to, it used to be capital punishment for counterfeiting the U.S. Of course, they can't do that now because of the Federal Reserve, the entire board would go to jail. No, that's right. And you know, and I they, think it's interesting in this LIBOR scandal, which truly was a scandal. How many people even cared about it? this show was covering it, for, but very few others. I mean, it was in the headlines like, you know, 48 hours and then just vanished. Well, the fact is that there were a lot of victims on Main Street as a result of this. Of This This is a very important story that ought to be more focused well, on. Well... And it was a deliberate manipulation also, by the largest and also Yeah, it's, it's well, a, it will be because yeah. there are... Uh, LIBOR is one part of nearly yeah. every derivative deal that was done. So there are going to be hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of right. lawsuits yeah. that could happen. So we're starting to see them and we'll have to it's see where it goes. It's also one of those like, victimless crimes. I mean, there are victims everywhere, but it's hard to identify it's the hard victims. to figure it out. The same thing with yeah, the Fed. There's, the no, Fed. there's not going to be a face of, of the LIBOR, right. LIBOR fraud scandal And also, victims. the other thing is it takes more than 10 seconds to understand it, which is mm -hmm. a, a big problem for the American public, actually. So. Yeah. <laughs> Why they should be watching Capital Accounts. Should be watching yeah. Lauren Lister. Yeah, because according to a poll I just saw, 66% of people didn't know who Jamie Dimon was 66 percent according to a Vanity Fair poll that's really freaky well I've seen some crazy polls that uh, that like say things like how many people don't actually actually know who the president is or the vice president well that's to their credit in a way you know I mean <laughs> uh, you know I mean the, the more you are ignore you know, politics the more sane you are you know? yeah. Yeah, so. before we go guys I don't have time to, to play the sound bite but the Olympic medals it turns out are not really made of gold <laughs> the gold medals they're only like one percent gold or something I mean what do you guys think of that is that the biggest fraud that you get your gold medal and it's not even entirely made of gold it rusts it's like mostly silver yeah. well it seems it seems to be perfectly they must have maybe they're made by the US Treasury or something maybe maybe that, maybe that explains there it. you right, go right? all right guys thank you so much for for joining us. Jeffrey okay. Tucker and Dimitri there on Loose Change. Thank you so much for watching. That's all we have time for, though. But be sure to come back tomorrow. And in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Lauren Lister. You can give us feedback and catch any shows you missed at youtube.com slash capital account. You can catch us in HD on Hulu at hulu.com slash capital dash account. From everyone here at Capital Account, our special guest to Loose Change included, thank you so much for watching and have a great night.